In the beginning, and even before, chaos was all that existed. Out of it came demons, the living manifestations of the chaos. Time had not yet been invented, so the demons fought each other continuously in a vortex of disorder over an immeasurable period. A state of raw chaos was intolerable to the universe, so a force arose to combat it, the power of law. From this principle of abstract order, a number of beings coalesced to combat the demons. These new deities of law suited themselves in gleaming armor made of pure stability and took up weapons forged of ideal thought. Then they waded into battle against the demons. After the battle had raged for uncounted eons, the law deities felt the need to track their progress. They created numbers to record the enemy's slain, and time so they could see how long victory would take. Gradually, however, the deities of Law began to suspect that the supply of demons was infinite. Weary of battle, they wished to move on to other projects, such as the creation of worlds and intelligent beings. So they made beautiful winged warriors to serve them and wield their divine magic, both in the endless war against the demons and in the worlds yet to be created. These beings, glorious in their diversity, were called angels. The bravest, toughest, fiercest, and most beautiful of the angels was Asmodeus. He slew more demons than any other of his kind, more even than any deity. But as the eons wore on, Asmodeus and the members of his magnificent and terrible company began to take on some of their enemies' traits so as to fight them more effectively. Gradually, their beauty turned to ugliness, and the deities and other angels began to fear them. Eventually, the inhabitants of the celestial realms petitioned the great gods to banish Asmodeus, and the most fearsome of his avenging angels. So Asmodeus was put on trial before Heronius, the god of valor. The darkest of the angels responded readily to the charges, reading from the great tablets of law that he had helped to carve. The first duty of law is to destroy chaos, he argued. I have performed this duty better than any. You have made war, and made it well, Heronius agreed. Yet you and your company have poisoned yourselves in the process. You are becoming a danger to the rest of us. Should we not cast you out? Asmodeus smiled and the smoke of a thousand battlefields rose from his lips. As the lord of battle, he pointed out, you should know better than any that war is a dirty business. We have blackened ourselves so that you can remain golden. I understand this is a difficult decision, but considering the circumstances, it's one that must be made. In the end, we have upheld the laws, not broken them. Therefore, you may not cast us out. Great was Heronius' consternation when he could find no counters in the tablets of law to Asmodeus' arguments. The Dark Angel knew the laws better than he did, and could wield the clauses like a knife. With the passage of time, Asmodeus and his warband grew ever more alarming in aspect. Fangs jutted from their mouths, their tongues grew forked, and they wreathed their bodies in mantles of fire. The deities were distressed, but could find no lawful way to stop them. So the gods retreated to their great project, the creation of mortals, and of verdant worlds for those favored beings to live on. But when demons invaded these worlds, the warbands of Asmodeus were called upon to stop them. Although the voracious hosts of the Tanari were no easier to vanquish on the new worlds of the material plane than they had been on the battlegrounds of the outer planes, Asmodeus and his dark angels generally succeeded in driving them back. Together, the gods and angels created barriers on the material plane to keep the demons at bay. Then the deities of Order made a horrifying discovery. The mortals that they had created, their pride and joy, immediately set to work tearing down these barriers to let in the creatures the gods had painstakingly tried to protect them from. The demons had promised them freedom, 
though it was a lie. The promised liberty is absolute anarchy. In a realm of demon, a mortal is only free to be destroyed. The demons whispered to mortals, stroking their pride and arrogance, and set them to this doomed task. The deities were flummoxed as to a solution. They could not take away free will, for the choice to follow the law means nothing without it. They could not remake the world, for the same folly would occur perpetually. Asmodeus came to them with an answer. Punishment. At this time, punishment was shaped like a mighty sword, though it has taken on many forms since then. When laws are broken, the wrongdoers must be made to suffer as a warning to others. Thus, mortals can choose between the paradise of rightful action and the torment of wickedness. A few will suffer punishment so that the majority can see the consequences of law-breaking. The gods were disquieted by this pronouncement, but as usual, they could find no flaws in their champion's logic. How could mortals be expected to choose virtue if evil went unpunished? At last, one of the godlings stepped forward and said, Yes. Retribution is the basis of all law. These words transformed him on the spot into the greater deity now known as Saint Cuthbert. On that day, the deities began to see that law and chaos were not the only principles in the universe. Good and evil were natural forces in the cosmos as well. So the gods separated themselves from one another on that basis. Deities such as Loth and Tiamat offered patronage to Asmodeus's poisoned angels, while Heronius and some of the others drew back from them still more. Other deities began to doubt the invincibility of laws. If this clearly evil entity could take advantage of mortals through the law, then what was it worth? Many of them wanted to secede, but the lawful deities insisted that Asmodeus's actions were necessary for peace and the growth of the mortals they loved and dividing themselves at this point would do more harm than good. The rebelling deities accepted this truth glumly, but still held bitter resentment. So the deities handed down their new laws, and sent their clerics through mortal lands to announce that the punishment for sin would be torment. Most gods were pleased with the arrangement. They truly thought that everyone would obey and that no one would actually be punished. But as mortals died, some souls trickled into the celestial plains who bore the stink of transgression. Asmodeus, aided by Dispater, Mephistopheles, and others of his dark brigade, set about their lawful punishment. They flayed these sinners and burned them and placed them on racks. The shrieks of the damned reverberated throughout the heavens, and the flowers in the gods' idyllic gardens dripped with blood. The deities of law tried to shut their ears, but they could not abide the horror. So they put Asmodeus in chains and again charged him with high crimes against them. I have merely done what I said I would, under the laws you drafted, said Asmodeus. Again, the gods had to admit that he was right. But I have a proposal for you, the grim champion continued. You wish to see the law upheld, but you do not care to witness its rancor consequences. So to preserve your delicate sensibilities, my followers and I will take our project elsewhere. We will build a perfect hell for you. You will gain from its existence, but need never lay eyes upon it. We shall put it there. And he pointed to an empty land which is now called Bator. Yes, yes, said all the deities. You must move your hell there, forthwith. Nothing would please me more, said Asmodeus. He extended his hand and a ruby rod of power appeared in it. But first, we must make a pact. A pact? asked Erevan suspiciously. Yes, indeed said Asmodeus, producing a document with a wave of his hand. It is to your benefit to ensure that we, who labor for you in a place you will not venture, continue to carry out your will. This agreement specifies the fate of damned souls. 
In exchange, it allows us to draw magic from these souls so we can fuel our spells and maintain our powers. I'm not sure I like the sound of that, said the upset Corellon. Your concerns are entirely understandable, O maker of elves, said Asmodeus in his most reassuring tone. But this will allow us to better fend off the demonic hordes. Would you prefer the easiest route to you be through the mortals you love? Assuredly not, yelled Pelor, appalled at the thought. So instead, take this leisure measure and simply sign this pact, he said with a smile. Thus, the law deities signed the agreement that determined the boundaries of hell and the rules for the transmission of wicked souls. Once it was signed, Asmodeus, Mephistopheles, and Dispater decamped to Bator, which was then a bleak and featureless plain. With them went a host of other dark angels that called themselves Erinys. What have you gotten us into? Mephistopheles moaned. This place has nothing, Dispater complained. Just wait, said Asmodeus. Then he explained his plan. The deities of virtuous law reveled in their newly purified celestial domains, now free of the cruel angel's degradation for the first time. It was not for many years, in mortal terms, that they discovered an alarming drop in the number of souls being transmitted to their various heavens. Upon conferring with their clergy, they realized that devils were corrupting mortals and ensuring their damnation by turning them toward evil. The deities formed a delegation which set off immediately for Bator. To their surprise, the once featureless plain had been transformed into nine tiers of monstrous horror and torment. Within its confines, they found countless souls writhing in pain. They saw these souls transformed first into crawling, mindless monsters, and eventually into an army of powerful devils. What goes on here? Heronius demanded. You have granted us the power to harvest souls, replied Asmodeus. To build our hell and gird our might for the task set before us, we naturally had to find ways to improve our yield. The war deity drew forth his longsword of crackling lightning. It is your job to punish transgressions, not to encourage them, he cried. Asmodeus smiled, and a venomous moth flew out from between his sharpened teeth. Read the fine print, he replied. The law deities realized they had been deceived by their own champion. Their own laws turned against them. Through their creation scheming, he had amassed enough power to rival a deity and become one himself. Through the deity's own laws, no one could defy his achieved divinity, and he became stronger every moment. They would soon be defeated. Heronius, refusing to accept this, realized the only way to stop Asmodeus's power was to beat him at his new game. He swiftly called forth a meeting with the gods inclined to rebel, pleading with them for a solution. After a sizable time of deliberation, the god of music, Litamara found an answer. Asmodeus soon noticed, the number of souls from which he could siphon power and torture began to dwindle. Filled with fury, he stormed the gates of heaven and demanded to know what unlawful deception the gods had cooked. You have whispered into the minds of mortals and subtly pulled the strings to draw their souls toward your realm. Heronius stated with a small smile, clearly enjoying winning for once. We are simply doing the same. There is no law against it. Immediately, Asmodeus spoke of the consequences. This is warfare, spiritual warfare. There are no laws preventing me from waging war on the mortal plane to forcibly take souls for myself, and your laws prevent you from stopping me. Not us. Asmodeus turned in surprise. Standing in the divine court were several gods, but they bore a strange aura. Not evil, not even law. One of chaos, but also of goodness. One of... 
freedom. Your war would be answered by us, said Alana. We now exist outside of the divine laws established from the beginning of time, so nothing is stopping us from interfering in your war. But surely you can see the consequences of such a war, Selenor Thalandra said. The mortal plane would be utterly destroyed. The souls you love to exploit would utterly vanish, and you would have no more soldiers to battle the demonic hordes that you swore to fight. Which is why we drew up this document, said Pelor, holding up a long parchment, stating how we as gods are to deal with mortals and each other. All gods from this point on, good, evil, lawful, or chaotic, will be subject to this single pact. So what will it be, Asmodeus? Alitamara giggled. Get your war and ensure mutual destruction. Or sign this contract. You've allowed these gods to embrace lawlessness, Asmodeus screamed. I have been fighting chaos for millennia. You created me to fight it, and now you permit it to exist. You willingly mingle with it. It was a difficult decision, Heronius said with a frown. That soon turned into a grin. But considering the circumstances... It is one that must be made. Asmodeus cursed. His campaign for power and millennia of scheming had been utterly destroyed in one fell swoop. Realizing he had been outmaneuvered, Asmodeus had no choice but to sign the contract. This document, as well as Asmodeus' earlier deal, became collectively known as the Comatose Law, the Primeval Pact. After the pact was sealed, Asmodeus was forcibly cast out by powerful law magic, thrust from the heavens into the hell of his making. It is said that he and his hells still carry the wounds of that fall to this day. For centuries, games have silently waged for mortal souls, with each deity pursuing them for different reasons. As long as the gods do not break the primeval pact, the balance of good and evil and law and chaos is maintained. In this way, the world of mortals is allowed to flourish. The rules of the Primeval Pact are as follows. 1. A deity cannot enter another outer plane not assigned to them unless they are invited, directly help or assist in a task of a mortal, directly save a mortal's life, physically harm a mortal nor directly use their magic to allow a mortal to come to harm unless 1. The mortal worships the deity in question, 2. The mortal has blasphemed the deity in question. 3. The mortal has transgressed the deity in question. 4. The mortal has attacked the deity in question. A deity may reveal their existence to a mortal, offer advice or education to mortals, whether directly or indirectly, send forth mortals on quests or tasks that the deity is not permitted, mate with a mortal once every 1,000 years through an avatar, the children of divine and mortal union may only naturally carry 1% of the deity's power. This divine bloodline will always manifest physically to set them apart. The child may not naturally live past what is beyond the average lifespan of the mated race. They may give mortals imbued objects. These objects may not exceed the power level of tier 7C outlined in the Versus Battalion Compendium of Weapon Categorization. These objects may not have abilities exceeding level 5 of magical power outlined in Bokob's Matrix of Magic. They may imbue mortals with power, done via spellcasting. Temporary demigod powers may be bestowed to restore balance should the demonic horde spill into the mortal plane. 3. If one should break the primeval pact, the deity is considered outside the pact. They are granted no protections from any deity nor law, and are to be subject to punishment. The sentence is always oblivion. If another should interfere with punishment, they will be subject to oblivion as well. 